Awesome. Hey, everybody. Um, before we start this session, I just wanted to let everybody know that we will be recording this session. Um, and after the event, it will be available on the Task Force for Global Health YouTube and website. Awesome. So let's get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Shumon Ray, and I'm one of the communications folks for the Task Force for Global Health specifically for the International Trachoma Initiative. And I want to welcome you to the third discussion in a series of panels called The Faces of Global Health. Today's topic will be Let's Talk About Being Asian and Global Health. This is hosted by the Task Force for Global Health and specifically the code group, which stands for the Council for Opportunity, Diversity and Equity. <clears throat> Code's mission is to become a role model in our local and global communities by being actively engaged in equity efforts in those communities and to help achieve equity in our organization and community through education, action, and public health. <clears throat> for those of you who may not be familiar with the Task Force for Global Health, um, and the work we do, we are a nonprofit organization that works in over 150 countries, helping to advance health equity so that all people can achieve their full potential. <clears throat> and today, in honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI Heritage Month, we are excited to host today's discussion to highlight AAPI voices in global health. AAPI Heritage Month began in 1977, and May was selected to mark two significant events. The first one is May 7th, 1843, May 7th, 1843, uh, for the arrival of the first Japanese immigrant to the United States. And the second was <clears throat> May 10th, 1869. Again, that's May 10th, 1869, commemorating, commemorating the completion of the Transcontinental Rail Railroad by majority Chinese immigrants. This is a moment to celebrate the achievements of AAPI folks, as well as discuss the challenges faced by our community. This is a moment to discuss how our identities not only affect our personal lives, but also our professional lives. We are still in a pandemic. We are still witnessing AAPI hate and violence. We have to talk about this. So today we want to have a conversation with a few of our AAPI colleagues in global health. They are not speaking for all AAPI folks, but these are a few of the experiences of being part of the Asian Pacific Islander diaspora. Today we are sharing four experiences of four AAPI folks and how they navigate belonging, opportunity, and sense of self. Now I have the pleasure of introducing the panel's moderator, Sammy Chow. <clears throat> Sammy Chow serves as the Senior Informatics Analyst for the Public Health Informatics Institute, also known as PHII. Prior to joining PHII, she worked for the Tennessee Department of Health, where she held various roles in immunization and strategic planning. She has also worked in the emergency preparedness for the Virginia Department of Health, conducted global health research in Ethiopia, and held a graduate assistantship in CDC's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Semi has a Master of Public Health from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health and a Bachelor's of Arts from the University of Virginia. That's absolutely amazing, Sammy. I can't wait to hear more of your story. Now over to you. Thank you so much, Shuman, and thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and to speak on this important topic. Um, thank you all, everybody who's attending, for taking the time out of your busy days to participate in this panel with us. I just want to really impress upon everybody the importance that this topic has for me as an Asian American woman to be able to have a forum to discuss these issues in my background and hear about other people who are going through similar things. Uh, we need to make sure that people who are entering the workforce in public health and global health hear stories of people who look like them and see people in leadership who look like them because representation really does matter in helping people be successful. And so I also want to acknowledge that sometimes this means the conversations can be difficult. Um, people. Everybody has different opinions and 
just because we're engaging in difficult conversations and might not always agree, that's okay. Um, it's a space where we're learning from each other. And I really appreciate the opportunity that Code and the task force have given us today to speak about all these things. So now it is my honor to introduce our featured guest for today, the reason you're here, the people you wanna to listen to. Um, so our first guest that we have is Dr. Carl Reddy. And Carl is the director of the training programs in epidemiology and public health interventions network at the task force for global health, which is also called TEFINET. So Carl provides strategic, technical and operational direction to the TEFINET network, which comprises of 73 member field um, epidemiology training programs, regional networks, and numerous partners and stakeholders across the globe. Before joining TEFINET, Carl was the director of the South African Field Epidemiology Training Program in Johannesburg. And during his tenure, the program transitioned from being dependent upon CDC funding to becoming owned by the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. Carl completed his medical degree at the Nelson R. Mandela School of Medicine in Durban, South Africa. And he has extensive clinical experience as a medical officer in pediatrics, um, and in primary health care in Saskatchewan, Canada. He's also worked in other parts of South Africa and in England, and he has a diploma in anesthetics, which he realized um, he recognized his calling and pursued a four-year residency in public health and graduated with the fellowship of the College of Public Health Medicine. Our next panelist that I'll be introducing today is Kirija Shankar, and she is the head of Neglected Tropical Diseases at Christian Blind Mission, or CBM, which is a Germany-based international non-governmental organization. So with CBM, she works with a team of individuals to deliver neglected tropical disease interventions in partnership with national programs and implementing organizations in nine countries in Africa and the Middle East. Kirija grew up in India, attended university and graduate school in Chennai, and soon after graduate school, picked up essential public health skills um, in, as an enumerator on an HIV AIDS research project in the Tamil Nadu state. She's been working on improving her headstand this past pandemic year. So we can all aspire to have the skills that Girija has. I can't do that yet. So kudos to you. And our other panelist today is Mariana Stevens. Mariana is the deputy director um, of the Children Without Worms program at the Task Force for Global Health. So before joining Children Without Worms, Mariana worked with the Neglected Tropical Disease Support Center providing strategic planning and directing the development and implementation of complex multi-institutional operational research programs coordinated by the NTD Support Center. Her focus was on targeting the special challenges of national NTD programs supported by USAID and provi providing a rapid research response to these programs. Prior to joining the task force, Mariana has worked with CARE, World Vision International, and Habitat for Humanity International in various technical areas focusing on WASH, internal and child health, food security, nutrition, um, and she began her public health career in Zaire and Mali, serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in the early 1990s. I am so impressed by the panel we have here for you today. Everybody has a diverse background and everybody is incredibly impressive. So I just, um, I am so appreciative that we get the chance to learn from our wonderful panelists today. So, to start this, I wanted to go into just the generals of everybody's background. So people come into careers in public health for all different reasons, all different routes. I know I've spoken a little bit about each of your educational and professional backgrounds, um, but I wanna each ask each of the panelists, how and when did you become aware of public health and what made you pursue public health? Um, Carl, if you can kick us off, I'd love to hear about your background in public health. Sure, thank you, Sammy. Um, you know, after qualifying from medical school, I worked in clinical disciplines. I did clinical work for a good few years. So I worked in pediatrics, uh, emergency medicine, and primary health care. And I was doing my residency, my registrar training in anesthetics, when I suddenly had that uh, eureka moment. And I felt like I wanted to have a far bigger impact on people's health. So instead of treating successfully uh, individual patients, I wanted to be part of improving the quality of life and health of bigger populations of groups of people and influencing policy and practice. It all sounds a bit grandiose to me now, but it was my sincere intention then. And I was also very interested, I guess I've always been very interested in learning other languages and cultures and traveling. 
And I realized early enough that public health lends itself, you know, to, to developing those skills and areas of oneself. So for me, it was almost like a natural uh, progression to move out of clinical medicine into public health. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, and so speaking of everybody's backgrounds and how, you know, languages and traveling and how that lends to global health, Girija, if you can give us your background and what got you into public health as well, we'd love to hear it. Absolutely, Sami. Well, first off, thank you so much to the task force and uh, to CODE for inviting me back uh, to participate in this event, even though uh, you know I'm working for a different organization now. Really thrilled to be back virtually. Um, so Sami, to answer your question and build off of Carl's, I grew up in India and uh, during graduate school, I uh, interned with a development economist, an agricultural economist, really, in Chennai. And that was my first uh, brush with development, as it were. And then after graduate school, I worked on a UNAI, UNAIDS uh, research project with a, uh, with a health economist. And um, uh, through this project, I got to visit small towns and villages all over uh, Tamil Nadu state, my home state, to better understand how uh, community-based organizations were provide, providing HIV AIDS uh, interventions and also to uh, research and study um, how much HIV interventions costed in, in, in Tamil Nadu state. I was actually a research assistant for a doctoral candidate at the London School of Hygiene. And so this was my first sort of um, uh, experience working at the intersection of uh, grassroots development, public policy, and foreign aid. And, and back then, most of the HIV interventions were uh, funded by USAID in Tamil Nadu. And so to me, um, I was really fascinated by all of this. And uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was less about public health but more about uh, the opportunity uh, to work in a space where I'd be able to advance the well-being of people living in resource-challenged uh, contexts. So that's essentially what I've been doing, you know, pretty much uh, most of my career. And I wouldn't know what else to do if I didn't do public health. And, and to Carl's point about, you know, being able to travel, uh, back then, I was just thrilled to be able to hop on a bus and, you know, go to these small towns and villages in Tamil Nadu. And little did I think that I would actually be able to, you know, visit so many countries around the world, uh, thanks to uh, organizations like the International Trachoma Initiative, for instance, where I worked for several years. So just, just thrilled to be able to work in this space, really. Thank you, Girija. And Mariana, I know that you also have extensive background around the world with global health. So um, what about you and your background? What brought you to the field of public health? Sure. Um, you know, I think my experience is, and all of our experiences are going to be different in how we got here. Um, after high school, um, I actually went into the field of environmental engineering. And because I knew I was good at it, I enjoyed it. It involved working with people in one way. Um, but after I graduated, um, I quickly learned I didn't want to sit behind a computer and design um, highway systems. So I quickly applied to Peace Corps. And um, before I knew it, I found myself in a very small remote uh, village outside of Goma in Zaire and um, started learning how wash was so important to the community, just safe, clean water. And it started to make me think outside of kind of just that engineering lens. And after Zaire, I quickly signed up again to serve in Mali because they needed some more WASH volunteers. I think everybody knows that there weren't many females in the field of engineering. So um, I guess being female, I was attracted to um, Peace Corps and I had the French background. But um, for me, really, it was quite easy to know that one way I was gonna end up in the field of public health um, my mother, who um, was the daughter of a Filipino immigrant, served as a captain in the public health service. So public health, public health was always a part of our discussions at the household level. 
but I didn't figure it out until I actually lived in those two countries, how much it really meant to me um, to make it a part of my life in my career. And so um, ever since joining Peace Corps, I haven't left the field. And I learn more and more each day how, um, how true it is to um, my career, my passion and my identity. Thank you for that, Mariana. That is, I love how all three of you had very different paths to get you to the careers that you have today. And I think that's true of most people in public health. Everybody's backgrounds are all over the place. There's no one pre-public health path that everyone takes. Um, and you are, are all perfect examples of that. So I also wanna talk specifically, You know, we've mentioned a little bit, we're here for Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And um, that phrase covers such a large and diverse community. And I think anybody looking at our panelists today can recognize it's a diverse community. Like we, all four of us here, don't represent the same backgrounds. We look different. Um, so when thinking about your own individual heritage and identity, how has your experience been similar or different to other Asian and Pacific um, Islanders in America or around the world, since I know not everybody here is specifically American. Mariana, if you want to tell us about your background and how, um, how your experience is different from other Asians, I would love to hear that. And I think you might be on mute. Sorry about that. Um, sure, I think that um, growing up, as I mentioned, my mother was the daughter of a Filipino immigrant and she, she was born here. But growing up, I saw her um, face various challenges and um, they, they differ definitely from my own experiences and now just even seeing my daughter's experiences. Um, as a child, I saw my mother being challenged um, both professionally and also personally. Um, and I think the, they both were difficult to not only understand at a young age, but um, throughout kind of my adulthood, they are a big part of why I have made sure that both of my children understand their um, heritage. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, when I talked a little bit about signing up for Peace Corps, um, one of the first times that I really saw that people saw me as different because um, I have a US passport and I always identify as American, but I do know the genealogy of my family. Um, but when I went into Peace Corps, um, people didn't identify me as a Mazungu. They identified <laughs> me as Xinhua Iko. And it was one of the first times that um, I saw myself as being different from my other peers, the other Peace Corps volunteers per se. And, you know, I make it a choice every day not to forget my identity, not only the Filipino, but, you know, my Native American um, background, as well as my French. And, you know, as we look at the generations and see my mother go through her challenges, both professionally and personally, I know the challenges and should I say the benefits being um, of mixed race background has afforded me, but also has created some challenges. Um, the interesting thing for me right now that I'm seeing is how my daughter um, is viewed, from, viewed by society. Um, she definitely um, is blonde and hazel eyes. Um, and she knows her ethnic background. Um, and we talk about how somebody will approach me and ask me where I'm from. And of course I say Texas. And the next question is, no, where are you, where are you from? And it's because um, people see it in me and actually I embrace that. I, I, I take it as an opportunity to tell my story to people um, because 75% think I'm Spanish, um, which I think is a beautiful, you know, um, background, but it gives me the opportunity to tell them about my grandfather um, and my grandmother, Tata, and the story of my mother and my story. So I think that for me, 
you know, throughout life, I not only identify with the Filipino, that Pacific Islander, um, my name in itself will never let me forget about it. As we all know, Mariana, what Mariana Islands were a part of the Philippines at one time. And so my parents purposefully, I think, named me Mariana so that I would continue to be able to tell the story of my grandfather. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. And I know that so many of us have gone through that questioning of, but where are you really from? Mm -hmm. Like, no, where were you born? That situation. So that is something that is shared often amongst racial minorities. And I think it's a great point about your daughter being blonde and hazel eyed, just because you're, you look different and you might be white passing doesn't mean you don't identify as being Asian American or Pacific Islander or whatever your heritage is. It's not necessarily what your face looks like. It's, it's what's inside and your background and your roots a lot of the time. And so Carl, I'm um, kind of following up with that, speaking about the multi-generational changes, um, how things have changed over time with the Asian identity. Carl, can you talk about your experiences and how they might have been similar or different to other Asians and Pacific Islanders? Sure. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Sammy. You know, I think obviously, clearly my experience is rooted in South Africa because that's where I was born and where I grew up. But, you know, I, I think the politics of race and the politics of, of rejection and considering certain groups as inferior or not quite as good as others, I think that transcends geographic boundaries, you know. So whilst my experience is different, uh, it resonates, I think, with ex the experience of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community here in the US. So my father's grandfather came from India in the 1890s. And my mother's ancestors came from the Indonesian islands in the 1700s. So, you know, remembering that the Dutch ruled the Cape and they also ruled a lot of the Indonesian islands. And they banished people, you know, there were political uprisings in Indonesia against Dutch rule and they banished people to the Cape uh, where they were enslaved actually. So my mother's a descendant of, of those people. And I, I, I mean, I remember, and of course, we've had very different experiences, my parents and I. So my father as Indian South African was not considered South African until the 1960s. I mean, his great grandfather came in 1890s, but uh, the Indian population in South Africa only became South Africans in the 1960s. Before that, they were considered aliens. And on my mother's side, you know, her family, she was Muslim, her family was Muslim of Indonesian descent. And when they moved to Durban during the Second World War from Johannesburg, uh, the city government didn't know what to do with that group of people that came from Johannesburg and were Muslims of Indonesian descent. They didn't know how to fit them in. So what they ended up doing is they ended up classifying them colored and sending them to colored schools. But in order to go to colored schools, you had to have a Christian name. You couldn't have, you couldn't have a Muslim name and go to a school rooted in the ideology of Christian national education. So my mother and her six brothers and sisters had to change their names. So <laughs> they had, they suddenly all had Christian names in order to go to school. And, you know, my, ex, my own experience, I, I couldn't help but laugh when Mariana said people didn't think she was a Mzungu. Because, I mean, even in South Africa, I, I have the experience where uh, sometimes on the phone, people assume I'm something else. And then when they meet me, then it's like, oh. And a similar thing used to happen to me when I worked in London, because in London, it's not everybody doesn't know that red is actually a, a, an an Indian surname, it's an Andhra surname, it sounds very in English, it sounds like ready, right, I'm ready, and uh, people, <laughs> I'd have experiences where I'd phone for stuff, and then I had to appear, and the person would walk right past me in the waiting room and call out my name, only to realize, oh, oh, are you Carl ready, because obviously it sounds very English, and you know, when I was young in South Africa, people would ask me, well, what's your real name? You know, so I, I guess for many people, I had to have a name that I suppose was rooted in Indian culture or, or 
Indonesian Islamic culture in the Cape. And I, I and my name is Carl, right? So the experiences have been different. Uh, I must say, I, I feel a bit more privileged. I think that my parents, I think like many parents everywhere, they, they sacrificed a lot, you know, for us as kids to make sure we had the best opportunities that they could give us. Uh, so it's been a different experience. I mean, uh, uh, from my parents' time to, to my time. Yeah, it is interesting how quickly these things change in history. You know, there can be a complete turnaround and, and it's different in South Africa than it is in America, certainly too. So thank you for sharing that because you have such a unique perspective being, um, being born in South Africa and having moved around to different parts of the world as well. So thank you, Carl. And Girija, what about you? Can you tell us about how your experience may have differed or been similar to other Asians? Yes, absolutely. First off, I just want to keep continuing to listen to Carl and Mariana talk about their respective histories. It's just so fascinating. And having worked with Mariana for a couple of years, I still feel like there are things I'm, I'm learning. And it's, it's, it's so wonderful, isn't it, to have these opportunities to learn about people's you know, people's life histories. Uh, to, to Mariana and Carl's point, uh, you know, I um, am not of mixed heritage, uh, much to my sister and my chagrin, uh, to the extent that we actually went to 23andMe, did a little uh, whatever uh, genetic history, and we are both, unsurprisingly, 99.988% uh, of South Asian, Indian, Southern Indian stock. Um, and uh, to, to Mariana's point about, you know, uh, chatting with people about where you're really from. Back in the day when I was younger and, and a new immigrant, you know, I would be a little offended by it. And I'd sort of want to brush past that conversation. But now I'm, I'm really uh, keen to engage people and, and chat with them. You know, have you been to Chennai? You know, do you like those eyes? And stuff like that. So um, I think it just comes with age, I think, more than anything else. But, but yeah, to your point about, uh, to your question, um, Sammy, I think um, as a young, when I was a younger public health professional, I was more keen to assimilate into the American workplace to sort of demonstrate that, uh, you know, I, I, I understood all things American and Western, not necessarily to erase my Indian um, or cultural identity, but more to engender a sense of uh, trust. You know that old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. I honestly think that familiarity breeds uh, trust. And so I wanted my colleagues to trust me so I would uh, sort of brush up on all things uh, American and, and, and want to not necessarily fully acknowledge uh, the, the, the rich, my, my rich sort of diverse cultural experiences. And uh, now, of course, I've come to realize that that is so important to the work that we do in global public health. And I, uh, I uh, you know, I'm, I'm fully sort of embracing of my um, cultural, cultural identity, uh, you know, back in the day, I still do, I still tell people to call me G. Uh, you know, as opposed to gear job, because it, it is a little bit of a tongue twister, but, but I often pause and ask myself, well, if this person is working in global public health, surely they should be able to pronounce my name. So something as simple as sort of, you know, uh, making your name simpler to fit in or to make it easier for people to remember you. My husband goes by uh, Sam K. In fact, his uh, uh, business card says Sam Krishnan as opposed to Sri Ram Krishnan. So that's, that's the extent to which we immigrants kind of have to feel like they have to uh, make it easier for others to sort of ease into uh, ease, ease into getting to know you. Uh, but I think now I'm uh, more embracing of my uh, Indian identity and, and realize how, how much value that uh, diversity of experience adds to the global health work, uh, workplace. And it certainly does add a lot of experience. All of you panelists, um, your backgrounds are what make you so unique and we're so appreciative of these. So I'm glad to hear of everybody's backgrounds and experiences and what you've learned and grown during your time in public health. Um, but there are also some hard things about being Asian that I wanna make sure we talk about today. And so 
particularly timely is the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it has disproportionately harmed people of color in the United States in a lot of ways, whether that's based on case rates or whether that's based on um, a rise in hate incidents. And so for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, this harm has manifested in hate incidents. And these are fueled by a long history of anti-Asian xenophobia and racism. And there have been stigmatizing references to COVID-19 as being a Chinese virus or a Kung flu or a lot of other things that, um, that make people target Asian Americans. And not just with the COVID pandemic, we also have things like the Atlanta spa shootings that, um, that killed several Asian women in the Atlanta community just a few weeks ago. So with this kind of increased violence against women and the elderly across the country, um, I would love to talk about to what extent we see continuities with today and current events with what has happened in the past. Um, so how, how are the events of today similar or different from the ways that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have been discriminated against in the past? Carl, if we can start with you, um, what, can, what do you have to say about sure. that today? Sure. Thanks, Sammy. You know, uh, I, I think if you look at the broad panorama of events, you know, and if you go back in time, you will realize, I mean, clearly that in certain countries like South Africa, like the United States, there is a historical legacy of discrimination against communities of color. And I mean, you know, here in the United States, I mean, it began with the arrival of settlers and the treatment of the indigenous people, the whole history of slavery here. There was lynching of Chinese people in California in the, in the 1800s. Uh, there were Japanese internment camps during the Second World War. Uh, after the events of 9-11 in the US, you know, uh, Sikhs and Arabs, or, you know, or, or Sikhs actually, many people thought they were Muslim and many Sikhs were actually attacked in the street and where they live. And I mean, this phenomenon is not limited to the United States. I mean, obviously, South Africa has an incredible legacy of racial, of racial discrimination, which is very well known as apartheid. I mean, Australia has its own legacy. New Zealand does. Uh, Canada, Canada does as well. And, uh, you know, and of course, you know, the, the, the actions of colonial powers in, in Africa and Asia. I mean, just the other day, somebody was telling me that, oh, actually, as a direct result of Churchill's actions, you know, how many millions of people in India died in famine, you know, the Bengal famine, where the food was diverted to support British troops, and millions of people died because of the famine in in induced by the transfer away of, of food supplies right from the population uh, during the second world war so i mean and many of these countries as well had a whites only immigration policy until the 1960s and australia definitely until the 1960s their policy for immigration only changed in the 1960s and then there was a lot of uh, South Africans of color who emigrated to Australia. And if I'm not mistaken, Canada as well also had a whites only immigration policy, I think until the 60s, I'm not sure about the Canadian example, but definitely Australia. South Africa itself, it's only since the first democratic elections, Nelson Mandela was freed from prison in 1991. And the first elections were actually in 1994. And only then were, were, were immigrants from other parts of Africa and Asia allowed to come to South Africa. Prior to 1994, the nationalist apartheid government had a whites only immigration policy to South Africa. So there certainly is a historical panorama and you know, so we, we, we need to see it in that historical pers perspective. It's nothing new. That's true. There is a long line of this kind of discrimination and racism. Um, and I think that that's also why CDC has recently put out a statement about racism being a public health threat. I think that it's important that we acknowledge that this has been going on for too long and something needs to be done to change it. Um, Mariana, if you can tell a little bit about your family's experience and, um, and just kind of historical background with racial discrimination, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And thank you, Carl, for, for, for giving me that kind of um, history there. Um, 
I, I just learned a lot in your comments. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Um, as I mentioned to earlier, my mother was a daughter of a Filipino immigrant, my grandfather, who um, was a merchant marine that came over from the Philippines to the States to serve in the States. And one of the things that um, the stories that I didn't learn from my mother so much, but I learned it more from my cousins, was that on his trip here, um, his first um, port was in Seattle, the West Coast. And he was held there in a camp because they thought he was Japanese. And he stayed there for three weeks so that he could prove that he came from the Philippines. So, you know, I think like Carl said, throughout time, we, we constantly see that there is this, this form of discrimination. And here was a form of discrimination um, from whether he was Japan, from Japan or from the Philippines because of what we were going through in that period of time. Um, you know, I, I hate to even share this story, but you know, when I talked about my mother and her challenges due to, um, should I say her dark skin, um, my father's parents refused for him to marry her because of the color of her skin. And so that's another form of racism where I love to hear when my father would tell the story that he knew this was the love of his life. And so they eloped. And one of my favorite things was finding after of course, both of them passed was a very simple letter from a hotel in San Antonio that my dad wrote to his parents saying, Anita and I have been married and I hope we accept your blessing. And so it talks about another form of discrimination that I think both my mother and father went through. And um, growing up, I wasn't allowed to meet my grandparents until I was seven because my mother was afraid because of all four children, I came out a little bit darker and she was afraid that my grandmother might do something to me. And so growing up with something like that, I think it's made me very aware and that I need to be careful, but also embrace and be very open to tell the story because um, I don't think anybody should have to be afraid of the color of their skin or their facial features or anything. But um, just from hearing those stories of the challenges professionally, how my mother had to work harder um, and then the ch personal challenges, I think were the ones that were most impactful on me growing up, knowing I was of mixed cultural background. So. Thank you, Mariana. And I'm so glad to hear that with the challenges you face, the way that you've managed to overcome them is to really embrace the differences and, and, and love it and appreciate it. And that's very enlightening to hear. And I think a great attitude to take when there are difficult things in life to deal with your skin color and race and things that you can't change. So thank you, Mariana. And so Girija, what about you from, you know, from your perspective, we've had all of these kinds of hate crimes and hate incidents, and how has it affected you personally um, along with historically? Absolutely, uh, thank you for that, Sammy. I want to sort of comment on uh, Mariana's point a little bit first about color prejudice. I mean, that's, that's a very real thing. Was, was a very real thing and still is growing up, you know, in, in India. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, matrimonial ads um, in, in classifieds and newspapers uh, to describe someone like me, if I were a, a, a young, uh, a bride to be, I'd be described as wheatish, apparently. Uh, and I think <laughs> wheatish means dark skin. It was sort of a euphemism for dark skin. You know, I'm able to laugh about it now. And even back then growing up, it wasn't that big a deal because my sister is dark skin. My dad is very dark skin and my mom is, of course, light. But the majority of us in my nuclear family were dark skin. But it was a very real thing that we just ended up internalizing and just acknowledging that fair is lovely and dark is wheatish, you know. Um, so th those kinds of things, those are, I don't know what they call stressors or microaggressions um, that, that we uh, live with, we've lived with. 
but but to to the to the point about violence uh, against uh, you know ethnic minorities, Sammy, uh, this is something that I you know speaking uh, from my personal standpoint. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't happen often, but when I step out for a walk or, you know, back in the day that you used to be able to go to movie theaters, I'd stop for a moment and ask myself, is, is this okay to do? You know, will, will people be targeted just in the broader community at large because of, you know, uh, gun violence essentially? Or if I were to go to the, um, the Indian store, uh, you know, at the intersection of in, 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 in Patel Plaza in Decatur, I often wonder, wow, is this is this going to, is this community going to be a target for uh, for for targeted crime? And um, you know, these are microaggressions, aren't they? As and that that you have to sort of face uh, every day. I mean, living in society at large, but particularly so as uh, as as a member of a minority community. So that's something that gives me a lot of pause. I think about the, the violence against the Sikh, the Sikh community members that Carl also referred to most recently in, Indiana, in Indianapolis. And I think about this uh, elderly Indian uh, gentleman that was assaulted um, in, in a small town, Alabama, just a few years ago. He was just going for a walk and, you know, he was sort of curiously peeking into somebody's uh, front yard and, and he was assaulted. So these are things that we think about. These are things I think about when my parents come to visit with me and always have to sort of send them out with a little word of advice or two or something that I'm sure um, everybody else here can relate to. Definitely can relate to that. I know that personally, I live here in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's, it doesn't have a very high percentage of Asian population people. So I, I know after the Atlanta spa shootings happened and I was thinking to myself, is it safer to be in an area that has a high population of Asians because then people are used to it and I don't stand out as much? Or is it safer to be in an area where I'm the only Asian because then I won't be in a part of a targeted population? And these are, like you said, microaggressions that we have to consider that get, that get to be exhausting. Um, and that, I mean, that just affect people whether they like to think it about it or not. It's just always there in the back of your mind if you want to have safety on the forefront of your mind. So thank you for sharing that, Gary Jo. And so, um, so around the idea of discrimination, I mean, I think we've, it, it's kind of impossible to talk about all these topics to have this Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month conversation um, without having these difficult conversations around racism. But there are also some, um, some positive sides to it too. So I know that in all the conversations around racial justice that have happened in our country in the past year or so, um, and even longer than that, um, we, we have to talk about standing up to violence. And, and that's something that cannot be done by just the group that's being targeted. And so I wanna talk about whether Asian Americans um, have allies in this society. Do we feel like there are groups that are helping and is it possible to bring attention to anti-Asian sentiment and violence in America? Like what is being done around this? Carl, if you could talk about what you've seen about groups outside of the Asian American Pacific Islander groups that are kind of banded and allied, um, how does this? How how have you seen examples of this in our current society? Sure, um, thank you, Sammy. I mean, before I get to addressing your question, you know, I just want to go back a little bit and say, you know, thank you so much to Mariana for sharing that story about her parents, and I, I think it's a reality in, in these societies. And when I say these societies, I mean you know, the United States, South Africa, Australia in particular, and in Europe also, that you know, people I think suffer, people of color historically have suffered a lot of injustices for the way they, they look or because of what they were different for and be, for the reason that they didn't fit in. And I mean, people have lost their lives, you know, clearly for the same reason. So, you know, just to say to Mariana that that does resonate and to say that, you know, it's only when you go through trials, her mother was clearly an incredible person. And when you go through trials and tribulations like this, it's only then that you get to know what your strengths are, that you understand your strengths. So, you know, I just wanted to make that point. And then to address your question more directly, Sammy, you know, to say that I, I think the, I suppose maybe coming from a, a, a a legacy of struggle in South Africa, the struggle for our liberation. You know, I think the issue of solidarity is, is critical. I think oppression, we shouldn't allow 
oppression to divide us. We shouldn't allow anyone to divide our oppression, right? And, and certainly we should never propagate the same op oppression, all right? And I think there are allies everywhere simply because there are decent human beings everywhere. And I mean, they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, you know? And I think it's important to, to remember that, that you can't paint everybody of a particular group with the same brush, just as we don't want to be painted by the same brush as Mariana and uh, Girija have pointed out. You can't also paint other people with the same brush. So I, I think we have to have faith in that, that there are allies out there, uh, there are decent human beings out there. And I think we will not really be free until we are all free, right? So we should avoid as far as possible not to drive a wedge between the, the group that we belong to, or we appear to belong to, and, and other minorities, okay? And also there's a historical legacy for, for this. I mean, uh, in the US when slaves escaped and were hunted down, you know, there were squads of slave hunters because there were prizes to be won to bring a slave back. And you know, many escaped slaves, there was the railroad to Canada, obviously, and people who assisted uh, slaves to, to get away, to get to Canada and start their lives in, anew. These are the allies, okay? Those were in those times, but these days there's allies as well. Um, many of the slaves found refuge among the native peoples of, of the United States, you know, the various tribes sheltered escaped slaves and provided them with refuge and helped them get along or where they wanted to be. It was the same in South Africa during the days of slavery in the Cape. Slaves who did escape were sheltered, you know, by indigenous communities living in deep rural areas far from all roads and means of, of uh, communication. So I think, you know, racism is a wall of separation. And, and while it keeps everything else out in the name of privilege, it, it also keeps everything else in, you know. So re really, at the end of the day, there's no benefit from it. And I think both the victims of racism suffer clearly. And I think also the the, the perpetrators of such ide ideologies and narrow-mindedness, I think they, they suffer as well. They might not acknowledge it or might not actually realize it. But honestly, to, to live your life in such fear of the other, you know, when the other can be embraced and you can enrich your own life and uh, I suppose learn so much. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That is so true that the other group, the separation into the, the in-group and the out-group is just so harmful to both sides of that. So thank you for your well thought out answer around that. And I just wanna make a note too, that specific to racism around the Asian community, we have the idea of the model minority myth. And so for anybody who isn't familiar with it, it's just around the idea that um, Asian immigrants specifically are successful at assimilating into American culture, that they're academically successful, high income, et cetera. But um, even though some people think that that's some uh, generalization that can be helpful to Asians, it, like you said, just drives a wedge between different racial groups. Um, it ends up being harmful because first of all, it's generalizing all Asians into one category. And as we've seen and discussed today, Certainly that is not the case. People from different countries go through different struggles. Um, and it also, it turns Asian communities into other groups. Even if you're claiming, you know, by being the perpetrator of these generalizations to be saying something is flattering to Asians, it's not flattering to be lumped into another group and always be seen as a perpetual foreigner um, and to be, to that's still discrimination and it's still a generalization and you're still not seeing people as individuals when you do that. And it also ends up pitting racial groups against each other. And like you said, solidarity is so important, especially in groups that have had racism targeted against them. And so it's important to not let um, myths like these tear apart groups. I think it's important that we be allies for each other. I know that um, Sometimes it's shown that, you know, if Asians are model minorities and they can overcome discrimination to be good at math and all the other things that 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 
the stereotype says, um, then why can't other racial groups do it too? And it, it's given as an excuse for why people can be racist and that's not an okay reason. And I know personally, like people have thought I'm gonna be always good at math and good at the violin and quiet and compliant. Um, and 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 you might think that it's, a, it's doing me a service when you give me these compliments of like, oh, what a good, you know, Asian girl you are, but it's, that's just showing that you're not thinking of me as an individual, you're lumping me in with all these other groups and it's a form of, it's a form of discrimination. And also Asians who don't meet that model minority myth are still worthy of our respect. And just because somebody doesn't fit that stereotype of being as highly educated, that doesn't mean they're any less worthy of, um, of the respect you're giving people who do fit that model minority. So I just wanted to kind of expand upon your answer with that as well, because I think that's something specific around Asian racism, anti-Asian racism. Um, so we've also gotten a question from our Q&A today. And uh, so somebody from our audience wanted to know, how do we reduce discourse and discrimination globally? And Mariana, if you could answer that question for us, that would be wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, uh, I think, it's, it's, it's an ongoing dialogue that, um, that we are all responsible for, not just individuals, whether you're coming from an American, um, Asian American or Pacific Islander or European or African American. I, I think that in order for us to um, kind of go through this continued narrative, you know, um, that it's really important for all of us to really understand individual struggles. It's not just, you know, me um, identifying as a mixed cultural background. Because, you know, Girja mentioned her 23andMe, and that was definitely one of the things, I guess it was um, about 10 years ago, I bought for all of my brothers a 23andMe test because, um, we kind of wanted to test genetics, you know, and see what was going on. And by no surprise, I'm 30% Pacific Islander, 30% Native American, 40% of mixed European background, but 10% West African. So it was a part to, that was a really good lesson for me to, to really understand that it's important for me to even dig deeper because I need to know that story too. And so I think kind of going through history right now, how do we change the narrative? Um, and, and, and it's not to undermine by any means any kind of identity that an individual has, but to recognize that as we go on in life that we are becoming by just the world itself, uh, kind of mixed cultural backgrounds. And that it's gonna be really important for us to not only understand, but respect, you know, the different forms of discrimination that we've discussed and how we as individuals choose to make them a part of our dialogue, whether it's in the area of global health, in our daily team meetings perhaps, or is it, you know, with our gatherings with friends in the backyard by the fire pit? You know, we have to figure out how to change the narrative in a welcoming way that it doesn't hurt anybody or hurt some um, potential um, downplay of someone's ownership to a form of discrimination that they've had to experience, unfortunately. Thank you for that, Mariana. And you're right, it's important to address that in all aspects of our lives, not just personally, professionally, everywhere. We need to have these conversations and figure out how to move forward. So speaking of speaking a little bit of that, of how professionally you can continue that discourse. Um, so thinking of the experiences that you've had professionally working in global health as um, an Asian or Pacific Islander, what kinds of experiences have been difficult for you? Mariana, if you could touch on that a little bit. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, because, you know, I go back to the panel um, that it was uh, females in global health. Because a lot of those 
continue to resonate um, for me. Um, being a female in um, global health, um, going to the field and working with a team that is probably 90% males. Um, what I try to do, I mean, I definitely have come across issues where um, the, the introductions might have been difficult, but I think those are the most important things is the introductions in um, when I go overseas and work with a field team. And um, I try to learn a little bit about their culture um, and even some of their um, introductory local language, because I think that that um, kind of helps bind and create that very natural next steps. Um, you know, if I can just go in and I still get laughed at when I talk in Dogon or Bambara when I go to Mali, but it it kind of it it releases any potential tension that might be there due to my gender or due to my ethnic background, because it tells them that um, I want to like we're going to work on this together and it's going to be fun and we're going to embrace each other's, one another's backgrounds. And so little things like that, that I didn't know in the beginning of my career have really helped me. And I know Carl touched on it a little bit is like this love for languages. That has taught me so much that has helped me deal with potential discrimination. That if you can just learn a few simple greetings to the point of like, how are you doing? How's your family? How's your goat doing? That is, is what has helped me deal with um, the potential of dealing with discrimination. So I think it's, it's like work you've got to put into it um, that actually um, is, for me, has really helped me um, kind of diminish or lower any potential discrimination because I know as a woman going into some of these countries um, that there is gonna be potential discrimination um, in the areas of my gender, but also my ethnic background. It's a great way of moving forward from any kind of discrimination. And you're right. I mean, I think we're all very human in this field of public health and that, that human connection you have with speaking in someone's language does go a long way into forging that bond and making that work easier. Um, Carl, what about you? Could, do you? could you tell us about experiences you've had working in the field of global health and how it may have been difficult for you as, as a minority group? Sure. You know, uh, I, I think in South Africa, when I initially decided to leave anesthetics and join the public health residency training program, um, one of the senior registrars or, or yet yeah, residents in anesthetics that I had obviously worked with and done cases with made a point of coming up to me and saying, and, and he, well, he was white South African, and he made a point of saying to me, uh, he thought I was a lot brighter not to go into public health, or he couldn't understand why I would go into public health. So, you know, like Mariana said, you know, sometimes you just got to count till 10 in your mind and center yourself. And so I turned around and I smiled at him and I said, you know, there's some very bright people in public health. And actually all the, all the advances in anesthetics, like, I mean, how do we know what dose of drug to administer to a patient to make them sleep? And how do we know what to do? All of that evidence has come from like studies. And this is like the domain of like public health, it's epidemiology. So all these epidemiological studies have come up with the evidence that we use, even in a discipline like anesthetics. And he said, yeah, and he wasn't like very convinced, but you know, you know, so that's the kind of thing I had to face initially when I decided to make the transition. And then, I mean, you know, clearly once I made the transition and I was doing my residency in public health, I mean, I remember going to a clinic in a, another municipality out of the city of Durban. And it was still like, obviously it was still the height of apartheid. And there was, uh, I think it was the financial manager of the clinic, uh, and he took it upon himself. I went with two other investigators from the Department of Community Health where I was specializing. And he was screaming and shouting at us and like wanted to throw us off the property because what right did we have? 
to be there and to ask the questions we were asking and who did we get permission from. And I mean, you know, clearly he, he wouldn't have reacted like that or done that if we were white, you know? So, you know, it's, it's like management. You have to change your management style with different people and in different situations. So, I mean, obviously in that occasion, I didn't turn around and smile and explain to him why I'm there. I screamed back at him and said, I'd get a letter back from the head of our department, you know, informing him and sort of authorizing, giving proof of our visit. You know, so you have all these difficult interactions. And I mean, and I mean, clearly, if I were white, you wouldn't have reacted in that way. You would have been more polite and more conciliatory and, you know, trying to find out things. But anyway, it is what it is. And you've got to deal with it to the best of your ability. And then, you know, I remember as part of the research we were doing, I had to go to this rural clinic and we went a few times and each time I went the head of the clinic, she was a nurse. She asked me, um, and she, she was indigenous South African, and she asked me, when am I bringing her samples? So initially, to be honest, I didn't understand. I kind of ignored the question. And then she asked me on the second visit, and then finally on the third visit, I said to her, like, you know, what, what samples did you want? Or, or, or what exactly? So she said, no, the stuff your father sells, you know, when, when are you going to bring us some so we can see it and we can buy off you as well? So you know, she had assumed that because I was Asian, and even though I was working in public health, I would still be selling what my father sold in his shop. So I said, oh, like my father doesn't even have a shop. He's not in business. He's never been in business. He's always worked for somebody else, you know? And so, you know, you have to be patient. I think people have this mis these misperceptions, right? And I mean, and clearly maybe there were other Asian doctors who had gone and sold stuff to people in rural areas. So I think, you know what, you have to give the other person the benefit of the doubt and take it with a pinch of salt at times. But, you know, so those were some of the experiences that I had. Thank you, Carl. And, you know, if you ever change your mind and decide to go into business and sell things, <laughs> I'll buy them from you. <laughs> But I am so grateful for the world that you are a doctor instead and sharing all of your wisdom with us here. Thanks. Um, so flipping to a more positive note on things too, rather than the discrimination, just the discrimination and difficulties that Asian, Asians and Pacific Islanders have faced in global health, um, Girija, can you talk about how your diverse background has actually helped you and benefited you in this field? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Sammy. Um, so you know, I sort of have to constantly remind myself that um, I enjoy enormous privilege. I might be an ethnic minority in the United States, but my uh, particular sort of cultural background, uh, you know, growing up as a high caste Indian, if you will, uh, upper middle class um, background in India, afforded me a lot of privileges. Um, I, I often um, sort of uh, think back to the conversation that I had uh, one fine um, weekday afternoon at the task force with Shumon Ray and Sarah Boyd, uh, my colleagues uh, who are at the ITI now. This is after five o'clock, we were chit-chatting and uh, I think we ended up talking about privilege and they, they sort of walked me through this very Socratic method of helping me understand what my privileges are. They were like, well, did your parents uh, pay for your education? Yes. Did you learn French in India of all places? Well, yes. How'd you do that? Well, my parents paid for it. Did you go to graduate school? Yes. Who paid for it? Well, my parents did. Who funded your trip to the US? Well, my parents. So, you know, um, I, I had, I, en I enjoyed, I enjoy economic privilege. I enjoy um, I enjoyed high caste privilege, and that's one of the reasons perhaps that I was able to, uh, you know, travel to the U.S. and, and, and live and, and, and work here. So I uh, am very much, uh, you know, humbled uh, by the conversations that are happening today in our global health community about global health equity. And, and even as I acknowledge that, um, you know, women perhaps in global health, while they are 70% of the workforce might not enjoy leadership positions. And in that sense, you know, uh, I might still be uh, battling, uh, 
you know, structural uh, inequities, uh, I have to sort of remind myself that I too have, I have privilege and how am I using that uh, privilege um, effectively in, 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 in advancing social justice. And, you know, to, to speak to uh, Mariana and Carl's points made earlier, uh, you know, we're sort of constantly battling stereotypes, right? Uh, Sammy, you spoke about uh, the Asian stereotype that is, of course, you know, the South Asian Indian stereotype. Um, I've been asked several times to fix people's computers and I will do it to the extent of my ability. <laughs> <laughs> and I welcome every opportunity to continue to do so, but but there is that there is that stereotype as well. Careful what you offer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so you know it's it, it's about I, I constantly have to in in this field, even as I acknowledge my privilege, I have to sort of sit back and wonder, am I being asked to do this because I'm a token minority or is this because I'm truly worth it? You know, it's that sort of second guessing yourself that I, you know, I don't want to always do, but, but I am sort of aware of that. Uh, so these are just some things that I, uh, you know, I'm thinking through. Well, thanks for bringing us along your, your mind as you think all these things through. I think it's all insightful and it's great that it's great to be aware of the privileges that we all have to everybody working in this field brings a different background and everything allows us different kinds of privileges and it's it's important to be grateful so. Um, and so Mariana with you have a, a particularly interesting background too with your mixed cultural background, so how has that benefited you in your work in public health. Um, yeah, thanks Sammy. Um, I think in the beginning of my career, you know, kind of post high school and preparations for college applications, um, you guys know my story. And um, in college applications, there's always those boxes you can check. Um, you know, African American, Hispanic, um, Asian Pacific Islander, and then there's white. And doing those college applications um, next to my mother, she clearly instructed me not to check Asian Pacific Islander and or Native American. When I know that that's 50% of my, my background. And um, it, it, it took me a hard time to realize why she was so adamant at not letting me claim those identities and again, it goes back to that generational and the struggles that she had um, with her career. And so she did, it was almost as if she was trying, it was a form of protecting me going forward into college. Um, and so I checked white um, because that's how I was instructed. Um, and right now, when I check different applications, whether it was just to get my COVID vaccine recently, um, I love the fact that they check, they, 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 the question is check all that apply because we don't have to choose. And I think that that's a really important, you know, when we look at history, that college application I did back in 1985, <laughs> that ages me a little, it, um, it didn't give me that choice. It was check the one that applies. And so I think that Right now, I think society is changing, but there still is that consist consistent narrative that we as individuals from mixed backgrounds um, need to continue that narrative and just change it in a way where we embrace all different um, ethnic backgrounds. And so I think we've come a long way. I can check all that apply. And um, I, I think that's one step. You know, we need to look at some of those things where um, we've come a long way and where my mother was protecting me from her point of view. Um, I see it now as I'm embracing my mixed cultural background and it's a form of not only educating, like I mentioned, you could do it in team meeting or in, a, in your backyard with a small group, but now it's a statistic, you know, in different in forms. Thank you. And I think that's a great thing that I means so many people are mixed race, have mixed backgrounds, and it 
you shouldn't have to choose. You should be able to put all of that apply. And then I, I love how in data collection and statistics now, mixed race is a group that's being calculated because you end up with you end up with factors that lead into if you have any kind of um, you know there's racial discrimination against a certain group and you are half that group that affects you as well. So I think that's so important to bring up. Thank you, Mariana. So we have a question from um, one of the participants asking, is there a way that you've brought your experiences to your work in global health? So Gary, Jeff, you can talk about how you've brought your experiences into your work and some examples of that. I would love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I often uh, think about this, uh, this trip that I made the first time that I went down to Haiti um, to um, support uh, to support some public health and development work we were doing with my former employer. And this is the first time I was meeting the team uh, on the ground in, in, uh, in Leogan, Haiti. And uh, after sort of some cursory introductions, I sort of plunged forth and went down this sort of checklist of things. And uh, Franck Toussaint, his name was uh, my colleague there. And he said, well, you know, um, usually in Haiti, when we meet new people, we sit down, we, uh, you know, greet each other, we ask about our friends and family uh, first. And that really uh, that took me back to my roots. And I was chastened a little bit because that's what we do in India as well. You know, you don't just, you know, launch forth in a conversation. You engage people, you break bread with them, you have a cup of chai, you know, you have some coffee, you get to know them, you get to know their family. And, and, and that's how it's always been. And somehow I sort of, you know, switched that sort of emotional uh, quotient uh, off. And um, I, I always, that's sort of a, a, a talisman for me, you know, uh, in, in the work that I do. And I make it a point, uh, whether I'm speaking with a, a colleague um, in, in the global north or south to, you know, just sort of engage with them, get to know their, their, their get to know them a little bit more. Um, and, um, and, 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 and then sort of, you know, uh, pursue the business of the day. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, I, I've come to believe at least that uh, trust in, in some communities and societies is uh, relational as opposed to transactional in some settings you develop you engender trust by getting things done doing the work and in some societies trust is engendered by getting to know people and then doing the work and so as someone uh, you know of, of, who grew up in, in in the global south I've uh, uh, I've sort of come to appreciate that and and more be more cognizant of that so it's almost like Working in global health brought you back to your roots. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. All it took was seeing another culture to bring you back to what you already knew and maybe had forgotten a little bit. <laughs> exactly. So Carl, I would love for you to answer the next question. As a global health professional, how do you navigate spaces where you are experiencing microaggressions from work partners or stakeholders in programs you support? Certainly. Uh, thanks, Sammy. You know, sometimes it's like, you've got to try to understand, I try to understand where the microaggression is coming from. And you know, more often than not, it's based on misunderstanding or, or, or miscommunication. But I can't help, I think maybe when I was younger, I was more strident or, you know, more reactive. And I think it's a function of age as you get older. And I can't help but remember a friend, a dear friend of mine in South Africa who's Greek Cypriot. We have a big Greek Cypriot community. And she would say, apply the three S's. And the three S's means smile, sigh, and suck it up, right? And I mean, the bottom line is, if somebody wants to give you a gift and you don't accept the gift, well, it remains with them, right? They bought the gift, so it's, it's their it's their property. So, you know, you don't have to take it on. I think when I was young, I took on too much. So now I don't have to take it on. I think I see things in a different light. So I'm able to navigate it, I think, through that mechanism, you know, explain, find a, a way of working around it, understanding it, but not taking it on personally, you know. I've got better things to deal with. I think that's going to be a big takeaway from this panel for me is the idea of smile, sigh, and suck it up. 
<laughs> I think that that's something that should be taught in, in global health and public health classes just overall. Anytime you're engaging with, I mean, honestly, not even just global health. I think that's just going to be with stakeholders in general in the world. Sometimes you just need to smile, sigh, suck it up, and accept that that's their issue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Um, so talking about the ongoing discussions we around Black Lives Matter and decolonized global health. Um, how do we approach these topics given our Asian background? And are there, are there pieces of advice for how Asian Americans can be allies to these causes and not further perpetuate these systems of systemic violence, especially through our work in global public health? Gary Jeff, you could talk about your work and, and what you've learned around these conversations. I'd love to hear that. Absolutely. Uh, this is something that I've, uh you know, thought about a lot and uh, uh, particularly with, when it comes to uh, the, the decolonized global health conversations, if you will, or the conversations around global health equity that essentially uh, picked up speed uh, with the uh, social justice movements from uh, last summer. So I would say our responsibility would be to acknowledge, to engage, to get educated and where and when possible to initiate change, you know. Um, I think it's um, the, the first step is in really acknowledging that there are certain um, structures, uh, institutional structures at play um, that uh, benefit how we do what we do in, in global health in the global north. And we need to acknowledge that it's not going to change today or tomorrow. It requires uh, structural changes. And so I think uh, I think as, as a very first step, we need to uh, get educated, uh, you know, participate in these conversations. There are so many conversations happening um, in the virtual space now about global health equity. So I would really encourage all of us to participate uh, and, uh, and and be active in these conversations, and then you know uh, I, I think I think the, um, the the code group that is at work at the task force is a great example of of that very change of that very grassroots change that is being in, initiated at the organizational level, right? I mean your very engagement with the global health community in in you know uh, being black and global health, Asian, uh, Latino, LGBTQ, I think that's wonderful and, and this is really where it happens. So so for, thank you for, uh, for for initiating this kind of change um, at the at, you know in global health. Well, thank you for being part of that as well and being so willing to share your experiences and engage with this, because as you said, I think this, this kind of conversation and learning about personal experiences is such an important way and we need to continue these conversations. So thank you for your, for your openness and honesty during this conversation, hopefully as a starting point for people to, to grow and learn and move forward with these conversations. Um, so the last question we'll take today is, for Carl, and do you think the model minority myth is partially fueled by the sanitation of the US's past racial atrocities towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders? Thanks, Sammy. Yes, yes, I, I definitely think it is. I mean, you know, throughout history, every civilization, every country has its founding myths, you know, has its narrative about its origins. And I mean, clearly the narrative is going to be uh, written or presented, uh, you know, through the voice of the dominant class in that society, in that country, in that civilization. And I think it's, it's true. I think history is, is generally, a lot of people don't know the history of the place that they live in, of the country that they live in very well. And I think maybe if people knew more, if they asked more questions, if they read more, you know, you would, I've, I've learned a lot since coming to the United States. I mean, you know, I wasn't sure about, I, mean, I learned about all the lynchings since I've been in the United States. And it's incredible in the United States, you know, everybody, their mother and their dog has been lynched and it, all communities of color. It's incredible. And I mean, this is not to knock the United States. I mean, this has happened in many other countries around the world as well. 
So I, I clearly think history is important to, to understand what actually happened, but the onus is upon the individual, you know, to ask questions, to inquire, to read, to educate oneself, because you're not going to get that education in the schooling system, right? It's only through your interactions with other people and other systems that you will actually get that information. I mean, additionally, in the United States, there's been Tuskegee, you know, the trials for, for syphilis, penicillin. Uh, there's been the, the Tula riots. There have been riots in Atlanta 100 years ago. I learned about all this since I'm here because I asked. I never knew it before. So I think, yeah, we should be educating ourselves. We need to be asking the questions and reading. Thank you. You're right. And if these educational systems are not providing that information, then the best choice we have is to move forward and try to do that work ourselves. So even though it's hard work and it is exhausting to read about these atrocities sometimes, it is important to move forward. And we can't rely on any one source to give that to us, to feed that to us. You're right, we do have to go out and find that. Um, so thank you, Carl. So we're running out of time here and I wanna make sure we have enough time for each of our panelists to kind of give us closing thoughts. Any any final words they'd like to impart upon everybody who's attended so far today? So if we can start with Mariana, if you can share with us any final thoughts you have. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about so many really interesting things and, you know, as a panelist, I've learned so much. Um, the one final remark that um, I think we've all touched on is, you know, moving forward and changing the historical, not forgetting the historical narrative, but how we can actually begin to open up the, the narrative a little bit different. And, um, you know, there a day doesn't go by where um, I don't forget my identity, not only that I'm coming from a mixed cultural background, Filipino, Native American, French, and, you know, recently 10% West African that I need to know it out, but, you know, Talking to youth today, I think is so important. And when I look at discussions I've had with my children and I've had with colleagues that I think ultimately it's really important for us to understand our identity, the identity of others and who we are as a person. Because it goes back to that comment that Carl made that sometimes we just, we can't fault any comments based on someone's potential lack of knowledge but how we can just get through it, I think is just gonna have to be um, just to kind of, you know, take, take a pause and, and, and figure out how to way to go forward and sign. Um, but yeah, I think that ultimately we all individually um, understanding our identity, the identity of our colleagues, um, our friends, and, and really the person who we are. Thanks. Thank you, Mariana. Jerija, what about you? Any final thoughts for the group today? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to share my, you know, my, my opinions and my sentiments with this, this wonderful panel. So thank you so much, Sammy. And it was lovely to learn about you as well. But, you know, I've been reflecting a lot about uh, what it means to do global health, um, practice global health, really uh, to alleviate suffering from disease in the global south, even as I do that work from the uh, comforts of my suburban home here in Atlanta. Um, I, I don't know that I have any answers to that uh, immediately, but I want to be able to sit uh, in that discomfort and self-awareness so that um, everything that I do is informed by that perspective. Thank you, Kirija. And what about you, Carl? Any final thoughts today? Sure. Thanks, Sammy. You know, it's just that, you know, I think it's always useful to, uh, you know, take a step back sometimes and not be reactive, right? And to give the other person the benefit of the doubt, you know, if there is a doubt, okay, well, maybe he doesn't understand or he's not clear, maybe I can help him understand, be clear. And I think it all boils down to at the end of the day, we need to maybe respect each other more, we need to you know, we, we, we need to acknowledge the humanity in each other, you know, more than anything else. And I, I, I think, and it's about respect and affording people their dignity. We need to, I think those are the principles we should 
yeah, it's sometimes easier said than done, but we need to strive towards that. Everything is always easier said than done, isn't it? <laughs> but thank you for that, Carl. And I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, would like to thank all three of you, Carl, Girija, and Mariana, for you were so open and so honest and so vulnerable today. And I am really grateful for sharing your stories, um, the ability that I had to learn from you all. I know at the beginning we talked about Asian American Pacific Islander mentors that we've had, and I look forward to following you all, using you all as mentors, because you're so informative, you're all so well-spoken, um, so well-respected in the field. So thank you to all of, all of you for that. And I also wanted to thank the Council for Opportunity, Diversity, and Equity at the Task Force for Global Health. Code is, um, thank you, Code, for putting these on, and thank all of you as attendees for taking the time out of your day and attending this and being part of our discussion today and asking your questions. So if there are any follow-up questions or we didn't get to your questions, please submit them to askhr at taskforce.org um, and visit taskforce.org to learn more about our organization or to find the recording of today's session. But really, I would just like to most of all extend my gratitude to everybody who participated in this. I have learned a lot and I hope you have as well. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Sam. Thank you very Thank you much. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.